Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. All right, you may be seated. Let's see. Thank you. Hey, I don't know if you, uh, first of all, you guys, you know, you just enjoy this kind of music and the worship and the band and that team every Sunday. See, maybe you don't know what a special gift that is. If not, man, they just did a great job. You know, you can, you can come in, <clears throat> kind of maybe bummed out by what happened this week or burned out or whatever, or tired or just kind of discouraged. And boy, when the, when the worship starts, it just, the world changes, doesn't it? I know, it, you know, it did for me. It came in this morning, kind of tired a little bit and got up early and drive and, um, and it, but it, but it changes not because they're such awesome musicians or anything like that, but it's because they're worshipers themselves. And they just point us to the Lord. And that's where we find our hope. <clears throat> that's where we find our encouragement. And that's where it all is. And so I just thank you guys and gals for everything. It was just super. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. <clears throat> I guess by now you've figured out that this is Father's Day. <laughs> I mean, it's like the, the whole focus, right? And I just want to say the same thing. I just want to say happy Father's Day to all the dads. But also happy Father's Day to all the uh, stepdads. Because that is what I had in my life was a stepdad. Uh, my father was similar to Abby's, you know, kind of a, a, it was a mess. It was a mess. And we had a guy who came into my mom and my brother's life and just uh, brought stability and a peace and a joy. And, uh, and um, I just, so I just want to encourage you stepdads as well. Don't ever let that word step sound like it's secondary. Because to me, even to use that word of my dad, he was my dad. He was my dad, and uh, there's, the law may say it's a stepdad or something like that, but he, he adopted us and brought us in, and I got such a picture of what Father's God's heart is, who adopted us into his family. And so happy Father's Day to all the dads. Happy Father's Day to all you stepdads. Don't ever let that uh, keep you from loving those kids like they're your own because they are. They're a gift from God as well, and that's what we experienced, and um, so, and, and you know, you do it no matter how they respond, how they react. You're doing it as unto the Lord. You're an example to them of God's love for them. Because many of us reject God's love too for many years, didn't we? And, and somehow God's love just continues to us. It says it's the goodness of God that draws us to repentance. It's not hellfire and brimstone. I mean, you may have initially turned from that, but it was the goodness of God, it says, that draws us to repentance. So for all you stepdads too, and it was referred to even for all you, you moms that you, you'll never be a dad, but you did, a, you did the, the mom thing in a way that as much as possible filled that gap. And you know, there's a wonderful promise in scripture. It says, God will be a father to the fatherless. And whether that's orphans or whether you've just been abandoned or whatever, you know, you've got a dad. You've got a father. It's in the heavenly father. And he says, I will come in and fill that gap in a very special way. We just need to look to him. We just need to trust him and all that. So um, thanks. Happy Father's Day to all, to everybody. And to granddads, too. Uh, I get the privilege of being now that a grandfather. And, uh, you know, in the, in the Talmud, it says, when you teach your son... The Talmud is a collection of Jewish wisdom and proverbs and sayings and teachings. When you teach your son, you teach your son's son. So dads, remember that. What you're doing is a generational thing that's going to impact even after you're gone. You're teaching your son's sons. And, and as a granddad, grandfather, we have the privilege of doing that as well, pouring into life your kids. And I just want to encourage you grandfathers to do that intentionally. I mean, they may be across country, or your grandkids may be somewhere else, but you know, you can write letters or cards or, you know, do a little recording on your phone and send it to them. Maybe the five things you want your grandkids to know. Be intentional about that because grandkids need that generational input as well. And so I just want to encourage you to do that. That, that, that goes for grandmas too and, uh, and for mothers as well, all that. You know, be intentional about depositing into your kids because you are impacting not only that one, but the next generation. And I, and I don't know, sometimes when we see these, you know, these noble pictures and all these wonderful things, you can sit there and go, man, I'm just struggling to get by the day with my kids. I got mad at them yesterday, and I, you know, I wasn't the wonderful pa dad who did all that stuff. You know, hey, we've all been there. You know, I can remember Father's Days and just thinking, geez, I'm just trying to get by this, this week, you know, and not throw my kid off a cliff somewhere. You know, you all know. Y'all know Joel, right? Okay. 
You understand, okay? Yeah, by the way, in case you don't know, my name is Rick. I am better known here as Pastor Joel's dad, you know? And over here is Pastor Joel's mom. And so uh, we are delighted to be here with you today. And uh, so you understand how, man, I just, growing up, it was just, if I can just keep from killing this kid, I used to tell Joel, I said, Joel, the gifts that God's put in you, they are going to someday be a great blessing to many people if I don't kill you first, you know? And so we made it, we made it, and uh, it came true. So anyway, thank you guys for loving him and for, for um, just... Boy, you've made a tremendous impact on him as well. It's just so evident to us, the impact that you as a family have made upon him. And uh, so thank you for helping me raise my kid, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and one other thing to fathers before we, you know, turn, this isn't even the message for today, okay? This is just preamble, I guess you'd call it. But you know, the Bible talks about Jesus being the prophet, being a priest, and being a king, you know, men, he's called us to be the same thing. And this isn't just, this isn't just for dads. This is, this is for, for men and women as well. But, you know, the, a prophet, what a prophet does is he speaks the word of God. And as a dad, as a father, God's called you to be, the, to be the prophet in your home. And that's not telling the future and knowing what's going to happen and all that, but it's speaking the word of God into situations. When something's going wrong, you know, speak the words of hope. Speak the words of, of God into that situation. Go, well, I don't know the words of God. Well, you got it there. Get to know it. You know, you got, he, he gave it to you in a book, and you just get to know it and get to know. And, and you're hearing it as you come in here. Just soak yourself in what you're hearing here. And realize, I'm not just hearing this for me, but I'm, take, I'm a prophet. I'm called to take these same words, speak them into my family during the week when things are falling apart. Speak them into my workplace. Speak them into my employees or my employer or, or where I go. Speak them into my neighborhood. That's what a prophet does. He simply speaks the word of God. There is hope. There is help. There, and you speak those words of, of life and words of encouragement. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. So what we say is very important. What we say to our kids is very important. Are you speaking life? Are you speaking hope? Are you speaking encouragement into them? Or are you speaking death into them? And sometimes we're going we're gonna to get it wrong. But that's what forgiveness is all about. And so go back and apologize when you get it wrong. Apologize to my kids. Well, they won't respect me. They'll respect you more. Because they knew you were wrong. They didn't know you knew you were wrong. And so when you go, man, I really messed up. I am sorry. They see that the, how they can then learn to come to the Father God and say, I really messed up, God, and receive forgiveness. So be the prophet in your home, but also the priest. What a priest would do is he would, he would tie God to the people. He would bring God to the people. He would represent God to the people. And he would also then represent the people to God. That's what a priest does. He ties these two worlds together. And how do I do that as a priest in my home? Well, with my kids, I'm, I'm bringing them before the Lord in prayer and in intercession and presenting the needs of my family, the needs of my wife, the needs of my family, the needs of my workplace. I'm a priest at my workplace as well. See, he called us to be a, a, a kingdom of priests who worship the Lord. So how do I I'm a priest. I'm bringing the needs of my workplace. I'm bringing the needs of my neighborhood. I'm bringing the needs of my nation to the Lord and also imploring God to come and impact my home, my family. I'm tying these two worlds together. And that's what we've called to do as a priest. We do that through prayer. We do that again through encouraging and just through, through imploring God to have mercy on our nation, to have mercy on us as parents, to have mercy on our neighborhood and on our family and on our city. So God's called us to be prophets. He's called us to be priests. And then the third thing is that of a king. Now, we all like that one, don't we? You know? <laughs> and uh, I, I would just say at the start, if you're not fulfilling the first two roles, don't feel you got any right or privilege to fulfill that third role of king. And we think of the king as the guy who runs around telling everybody what to do, you know, chomping on a turkey leg all the time and just pointing out what everybody needs to do. You know, here's what you need to do. The king was the one who went into battle first. For the, he led the troops into battle. He went out and, and, and fought for his, his nation, and he led the troops. And they were encouraged because the king was at the front, and the king was leading them. And so a king goes to war for his family. We, we're hearing a lot today in, our, in, in the world about toxic masculinity. You know, guys, you're supposed to chill out and sort of be feminine and be soft and gentle. And uh, you know what? God made us to be warriors. 
Don't you swallow that bait. Don't you fall for that. God made us to be warriors. God made us to be strong and, and to be tough and to be able to take the blows and keep on going. You see in the scripture, Abraham, you know, the, the first one that God started the line of the Messiah through, when his nephew and the whole city was kidnapped and hauled off to be enslaved, he got the guys together and went out and rescued them. I mean, he went to war and rescued them and brought them back. Abraham did that. You, of course, David, we know David was a warrior, a warrior at heart, a, a fighter. You know, he was out there defending his nation, even as a young boy, defending his nation and defending too, and this is the most important thing, he was defending the name of God. The reason he went against Goliath, he says, you know, Goliath was cursing the God of Israel. And he said, you know, you, you can't do that and get away with that. He went to defend the name of God. And he was a warrior. You see, you see all these others, Gideon, all the judges were warriors. They weren't judges like with the gavel in the book of Judges. They were warriors who led the people to defeat those who had come against them. And so as, um, as men, God's called us to be compassionate warriors. But, but here's the deal. We oftentimes think that the battle is against this person or that person or this person. But if they're flesh and blood, that's not our enemy. Though it says in Ephesians that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against powers and principalities and rulers of wickedness in high places. So if the person who's frustrating you is flesh and blood, just check it out. That's not the enemy. They may be a captive of the enemy that you're called to rescue and help and pray for and redeem. Save them from the clutches of the enemy. But our enemies are spiritual forces. The ones who are destroying your family. It's not, it's not the whatever you want to call it out there. It's spiritual forces behind those enemies. And so God's called us to be warriors who will stand up and defend our families and defend our nation and defend our communities against those spiritual battles. And so God's called us to be warriors, but it's not the warrior in the physical sense where you're out, you know, you're a tough guy, you're the hard guy, and you're knocking heads unless you're knocking spiritual heads. And you don't do that. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal things, the Bible says, but they are powerful through God to the tearing down of strongholds, to the, to the false ideas that are being put into your kids' heads. You bring the truth of God's word and tear down those strongholds to the false ideas that are being put in our heads all the time. Resist those things. And so I just want to encourage you that don't, don't be taken in by this toxic masculinity. I guarantee you every, every woman... If she's facing, we live in an insulated society here where we don't face much of the brutality of the world. You know, as a missionary, I travel, I see the world's a brutal place. The world's a harsh place. It's a hard place. And some of you know that. But many times in our country, we live in an isolated, insulated little bubble, and we don't realize the brutality of the world. But I guarantee you, any, anyone who's facing an enemy wants a strong man standing between them. You know, you don't want some feminine guy up there, you know, flipping his wrist at them, you know, hoping they'll go, go away, leave me alone. You want a strong man, right? Standing up there on your side, all right? Enough said, okay? So God's called us to be the prophet, God's called us to be the priest, and God's called us to be the king. And that, that's all, all of us. It may be the queen for you ladies, but you're to defend your kids as well. You're to stand up, be that mama bear. You know, the Proverbs talks about a bear robbed of its cubs. You don't want to get in between those two. You know, so be that mama bear and uh, defend those kids. We've, we're in a time when, like never before in my lifetime anyway, has the world been trying to chew our kids up. It's, it's Molech. Molech was the god of Canaan that, that they, the, Jew, uh, the Israelites came to and actually offered their children in burnt offering sacrifices. That this stone god was there and there was a fire burning in its belly and they would, they would make noise and sing and shout and all kinds of tambourines and drums would play to cover the screaming of the children as they would place their children on this burning idol that would then roll down into the belly of that demon. And that demon is, a, is around today again, destroying our children, wanting to destroy our families. And so we got to be mama bears and kings and priests who will stand up and defeat the enemy but it's not done by carnal methods. It's not done by worldly methods. It's not carnal meaning fleshly, our, our flesh and blood methods. It's done through the love and the mercy and the grace of God extended to those who we would think are our enemies. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Because none of that was in the notes, okay? That's just a happy... <clears throat> 
That's just a happy Father's Day greeting to everybody, okay? <laughs> you know, I don't think you're going to find that on a Hallmark card anywhere either, you know, so you just, you got it this morning. All right. Um, today we are in a series on faithfulness, and we're gonna, we'll, we'll just make this really short here, but um, faithfulness and Father's Day, and I thought, well, what better than to talk about the father of the faithful, the fellow named Abraham. He's, he's called the father of the faithful. I want to share with you one little thing that helped me a lot that I learned from this father of the faithful, the father Abraham. And uh, it had to do with, a, you know, this guy was, um, when he was 75 years old, um, an angel appeared to him, or the Lord, or we don't really know. It says a man came, but it obviously wasn't a man. It was more than just a, a flesh and blood man. And at 75 years old, he told him, you're going to have a son. And his wife was 65 years old, so she was a young woman, you know. Easily have a child, right? Not quite, right? <clears throat> and so he, he's, he was a faithful guy and said, okay, if this is what the Lord says, I believe this. And, and uh, so when the angel disappears, we're going to have a son. In fact, he said, you're going to have not only a son, you're going to have so many descendants, they will be like the sands of the sea. If you can count the sands of the seashore, you can count your descendants. If you can count the stars in the sky, you'll be able to count your descendants. Well, nobody can do that, obviously. We're finding out there's even more and more stars out there. The further we dig and the further we're able to go. And so he was going to have a lot of descendants. And I'm sure Sarah, you know, when she heard that, uh, wonderful. You know, I'm 65 years old, I'm going to have a kid. Aye, aye, aye. You know, I just can't imagine, right? <laughs> okay, I'm not sure that was intended to be a blessing, but it was to them. And that culture to have a child was, was a great blessing, even if you're 65 years old. So I'm sure after that promise, you know, they headed out to the store to get the pregnancy test, you know, because it's going to happen, right? You know, we got to get, and they, and a couple months, whatever the week or so, they used that. And it didn't work. There was nothing. There was nothing. And six months down the road, nothing year down the road, there's nothing, and, and, and nothing happened for 25 years. At 25 years later, at he's 100 and she's 90, this guy appears again, and he said, I'll be back next year, and when I come back next year, you're going to have a son. Oh, my, I think we've been down this road before, you know, and Sarah was behind in the tent, and she heard it, and she actually laughed. <laughs> You know, she said, this dried up old woman is going to have a son, and he's not much better, you know. <laughs> it's not going to happen, you know. And this, this angel heard her laugh, and he said this. He says, is there anything too hard for God? Good question, isn't it? Is there anything too hard for God? And I just believe this morning, probably all of us have had something that we... A dream, a vision, something God has deposited in our heart that we want to see happen. And we feel like it's from the Lord. You know, maybe it's, maybe it's something, maybe it's like Sarah and Abraham. They didn't have any children. Maybe it's that you want to have a child. And maybe you feel like God has said, I'm going to give you a child. Or maybe you've got kids that are running from God and you feel like the Lord, well, you know the Lord wants them to come to him. You know that's his desire. You know, in First John it says this, this is the confidence we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, which obviously your kids coming to the Lord would be according to his will, that if we ask anything according to his will, one, we know that he hears us, and two, we know we have the petitions we've desired of him. So well, that's a wonderful promise, but it hasn't happened, and it's been years, it's been years, and it's just not happened. And you can begin to feel like Abraham. Maybe it's, maybe it's a dream God's put in your heart that you're supposed to uh, get a better job or get out of debt. Or, or maybe there's a, there's a health issue you've been battling with. And you just really, you know it's God's will to bring healing there. You know it's God's will to bring change there. But it's, it's just not happened. And so all of us are, or maybe there's something you've been battling with. Something, you, an addiction or a habit or something you do that you need to stop. Well, there's something you haven't been doing that you know you need to start. And, and th you just feel like there's this promise from God that something is on its way. And you've been waiting for two days. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Or two months or two years. I, we need to know that God is faithful, but it oftentimes isn't in our time frame. He came 25 years later. 25 years. And it was now, it was, it was hard, I would say impossible for them at 75 and 65 to have a kid. But now it's impossible. I mean, it is a dead deal. It is not going to happen. And here's what I learned from Abraham. And, I, and you see this throughout the Bible. Many times before God fulfills that promise, that thing has to die. 
it has to get, it, it may be hard, it may be an, seem like an impossible thing, and that's when we need to ask ourselves, is anything too hard for God? Obviously not. But it gets harder, and it gets harder. And eventually, sometimes that dream dies, and you just give up on it. Well, this ain't going to happen. I must have missed it. It's not, okay, God does that for everybody else, but not for me. And I want us to look at Abraham and realize that in his life, we see a principle, the death, what we call the death of a vision. When God gives you a dream, when God gives you a vision, oftentimes that dream has to die before it comes to life. Because in God's economy, death comes before life. The world's just backwards. The world, we think life comes and then you die. But in God's economy, death starts life. We see that with Joseph, for example. He had a dream. He was going to be in a position of rulership. And the next thing he knows, he's in a pit. Well, that's going to be a little hard to get up and be a ruler out of a pit. Well, death of the vision. It got worse. Then he's in slavery. Then he's in prison. No way he's getting out. Is anything too hard for God? Nope. Next thing you know, he's, that dream is fulfilled. But he went through a time of death of that vision. It's not going to happen. It can't happen. One reason God does that is he wants us to know when it happens, he gets the glory for yeah. it. Amen. And I know that's the desire of my heart. I know it's the desire of your heart that God is glorified. Whatever happens in my life, that God gets glory out of it. That it brings a smile to his face. Whatever happens. And when when he gets glory from our life, the joy it brings to us, the fulfillment it brings to us, he gets the glory, we get the joy, we get the peace, we get the, we get the victory in it. So I want to encourage you. You know, you see that with the disciples too. They just knew Jesus was coming to, uh, to liberate them from Roman rule. They just knew he was going to be the Messiah. He rode into town victoriously into Jerusalem. And, you know, at Palm Sunday, all the people are, hey, all the, you know, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna, God save us. You've come to save us. It's going to happen now. We're on the brink of it. And the next thing you know, he's on a cross and in a tomb. Dead. But you can't experience resurrection power unless you first experience the death. And that's why the Lord says to us too, he says, if you want to be my disciple, the way is death. Die to yourself. Crucify. He says, you cannot be my disciple unless you take up your cross and die daily. Well, die daily, that sounds so miserable. Only in death can there be resurrection power. If we refuse to die, we never experience that resurrection power. It's like Jesus said of the kernel. He says, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it, ab it abides alone. It's just that one little thing. But if we will die to ourselves, live for God, he says, then that wheat, it brings forth much fruit. That's what we want in our life, isn't it? Much fruit. Jesus also said that when we do bring forth much fruit, it brings glory to God. And so all these ideas tie together. Dying to myself trusting him with whatever dream he's put into my heart, whatever he wants to fulfill in my heart. God, I trust you in that. Not my will, as Jesus himself said, but your will, Lord. And I know that his will is exactly what I would want for myself if I knew all the details. If I knew the background of the story, that's exactly what I would want. And so it's, it really isn't a great sacrifice. It's kind of a step of faith, but it's not a great sacrifice to say, not my will, but your will. Because you can know for sure that his will, again, is exactly what you would want if you knew all the details. I could tell you story after story of things where it's like, we felt like God said this and we were going, it just didn't work, or this happened, or we ended up over here. And when I look back on it, I go, wow. I'm glad you took me that way instead of the way I wanted to go because this has been so glorious but I, I didn't think it was going to be that great and I want to guarantee the same thing to you God is a faithful God and, and you may be at a point where things just don't seem to be working out you may be at a point where you're 75 years old and the dream ain't going to happen or you're 100 years old God, you're never too late for God He's always on time in his time. And when you see his time, when you see the way he did it, the time he did it, you're going to look back and go, wow, that was really good. That was better than I could have designed it myself. Is there anything too hard for God? Nothing too hard for God, is there? So as we, as we go this week, I just want to encourage you, 
wherever you are, there's a proverb, it's in Hebrews, Hebrews 10, and it says this, and this is a great one to memorize too if you need to, you need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he's promised. Sometimes it's waiting on God's timing. Daniel 10 also gives us some, read Daniel 10, it's an amazing story that gives us, it pulls back the curtain, lets us see what's going on. Daniel for three weeks has been fasting. For three weeks, 21 days, he's been fasting, trying to hear from God, trying to connect with God. And an angel finally comes after three weeks. And he says, Daniel, the first day you set your heart to start praying, the first day I was dispatched. And if I'd been fasting 21 weeks, I'd be just grumpy enough to say, well, what kept you so long? Where have you been for 21 days? I'm hungry down here, you know. He was fasting for 21 days. First day I was sent. It must have been a long trip. No, he says the prince, a demonic force resisted him. There was warfare going on in the heavenlies. And he said, I came. And finally, Michael came. And he's still up there doing the battle so that I could come and bring you this message. So he brought him the message, amazing message. And then he said, now I got to go back and fight that battle. There's warfare going on. Sometimes it's God's timing, but sometimes there's just warfare. And you got to battle it through. And say, I'm going to hang on to this thing. Jesus told a couple of parables and several times he said, it's important that you pray and keep on praying. Persistence. He tells these parables of the importance of persistence in prayer. The point is, never, ever give up. Keep your hope on him. Because he is taking you from where you are to the promised land that he has for you. And he is faithful. And he will not let you down. And when we get to the end, we'll be able to look back. Sometimes in the middle of it, we don't understand what's going on. You read a story, and you don't know what's going on in the middle. And you get to the end, and you go, oh, <laughs> all the pieces make sense now. He knows the end from the beginning. Jeremiah says, I know the thoughts I have for you. Thoughts, plans for good, not for evil. I'm taking you to an expected end. I know the last chapter in your life. I know what I'm doing here. Trust me in it. And you're going to find God is a faithful God. may not really look like it all the time until you get to the end, and you look back and go, unbelievable. What a God you are. So I just want to encourage you with that. Wherever you are in, in your life, in your walk, you can know that God's plans for you are good and you need to persevere. Hang in there. Stick with it so that when you've done the will of God, you know that you will inherit and receive that promise. It's good, isn't it? That's good God. I'm so good. So glad he's faithful. Amen. Let's thank him. Lord, we just thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you that you are a faithful God. And God, we want to apologize for the times that we've doubted you and the times we've kind of wondered and the times we've questioned your, your, your divine control of the universe, Lord. Sometimes we think we know what's best for us. And yet we're just these dumb, blind people who can only see a few feet in front of us. But you see our end from our beginning. And you know where you're taking us. And so we thank you, Father, for your guidance in our lives. We just trust you. Lord, we, we, some of us, we've taken our trust away from you. We've trusted in our own abilities. We want to right now, just as an act of our will, put that back on you. We trust you. We know, God, that you're at work, working all things together for, for the good of those who love you. Those of us, all of us here who've been called according to your purpose. May your purpose be accomplished in us and through us. In the holy and wonderful name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. And amen. Thank you, Pastor Rick. That was powerful. I want to just let you know before we close out today that uh, we don't take an offering here, and that's for a reason, because we trust God and his faithfulness. He doesn't need our money to do his work, but he wants us to trust him and I think he's asking some of us today, will you trust me with that? Will you trust me with that 10%, that tithe, that offering that I'm calling you to give? Because he can do more with the 90 than we could ever do with the 100. And I truly believe that. And so there's ways to give on the screen while we sing this next song. Let's just stand and proclaim this together because God is so faithful. And this song is one of my favorites of all time. Faithful, that is who you are. So let's sing this together. Faithful. That's who you are, more than able to care for my heart. Father and friend, there till the end, you are faithful, oh God, faithful. faithful. 
faithful that's who you are more than able to care for my heart father and friend there till the end you are faithful oh god you are faithful oh god yes he is he's so good i love you I'll see you next week. You are dismissed. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.